Hello, I'm Kirk Weiler, and this is Common Core Algebra 2 by eMath Instruction. Today, we're going to be doing unit number 12, lesson number 4, on conditional probability. Now, I'd say that many of the things that we've looked at so far in probability, you've seen before. And even if you hadn't seen them, probably as soon as I showed them to you, eh, you were probably fairly comfortable with them. Even in the last lesson, where we looked at adding probabilities as we tried to find the probability of a union of two events. Today we get into something that is a little bit different, known as conditional probability. All right, And again, never forget that what probability is all about is quantifying, which means putting a number, right? Quantifying means to assign a number, assigning a number that measures how likely something is to happen. Okay? Never forget that, because it's going to get a little weird today, but we're going to try to make as much sense of it as we can. All right, let's jump into it. Now, we're going to revisit a two-way frequency chart we saw in the last lesson. Okay? Um, just remember, what this was, was that we had 52 graduating seniors. Okay? And they were surveyed about their plans after graduating. And then we broke it down into four different events. You know, the person was male, the person was female, the person was going to college, the person was not going to college. Okay, now you should certainly be able to do letter A and letter B. So why don't you go ahead and do that? All right. Well, letter A just says, what's the probability they were female? Well, that's going to be the number of females, the number that fall into that event, divided by the total number in the sample space. The number of females was 22. The number in the sample space was 52. We could leave it like that. I'm going to start expressing these more and more often as decimals. Turn it around to the nearest hundredth. That's 0.42. Okay? Of course, the probability of going to college will be the number of students going to college divided by the number total. The number of students going to college, that's up here. That's 29 divided by 52. And again, accurate to two decimal places, about 0.56. All right, so simple enough. Now, before we go on to letter C, again, I want you to really understand this because probability slippery, all right? I close my eyes. I randomly grab one of these 52 students. I don't know anything about them other than the fact that I randomly grab them and they come from one of these 52. There's about a 42% chance that I picked a female. And there's about a 56% chance that I picked somebody going from college, going to college. Now let's look at letter C, because this gets into conditional probability. Letter C says, figure out the probability that a person is going to college given that they're female. All right, and let's take a look at that notation, because you're going to see this a bunch, and it's a bit confusing. It almost looks like we have a fraction bar in there, but we don't, okay? Anytime you see something like this, okay, this is the probability of A happening given that you know B has happened. All right, given that you know B has happened. All right, so again, the probability of this happening given this has happened. All right, so the probability that we're going to college given that we picked a female. Now I'm going to kind of erase this, otherwise I'm not going to really have any room. Let's go large. There we go. All right. Now, understand really where this is coming from. Remember, I close my eyes, grab one of the 52 at random. What is the probability they're female? 42%. What's the probability they're going to college? 56%. But let's say I grabbed somebody at random, and I looked at them and I said, oh, I picked a female. Now the question is, what's the probability I picked somebody who's going to college? All right, it's no longer 56%, right? But what is the probability? Remember, I know the person I picked is female. 
So what's the probability that the person I picked is going to college? Well, what I'm hoping that you said is I'm hoping you said the probability that they're going to college, given that they're female, is now 13 out of 22. All right, and let's understand why, okay? You know, females, the people that are sitting in this circle, break down two ways, right? Those that are going to college, and there's 13 of those, and those that aren't going to college, and there's nine of those, right? The people going to college break down two ways. There are people that are, you know, the, they're the ones that are the females, and they're the ones that are male, okay? But the idea is, as soon as we know that the person that we picked was a female, then this is now our sample space. This is now our sample space. That additional information allows us to ignore all other people except for those that sit inside of the female category. And of course, then there are a total of 22, and the number that are going to college are 13 out of that 22, and that's about 0.59. Now again, this is kind of cool. So again, but just pause for a second. If I close my eyes and I grab somebody at random, and I say, what's the probability they're going to college? The answer is 56%. On the other hand, if I close my eyes, grab somebody at random, pull them over, open my eyes, see that they're female, now the probability they're going to college is 59%. It's actually, it's actually higher. Not a lot higher, but it's higher. Okay? And that's the idea of conditional probability, is that we're now calculating the probability of an event based on the fact that we know that another event has happened. Okay, pause the video now and think about this before we move on. Clear this out. Let's keep working with the same table in letter D. Letter D says, which is more likely that a person picked at random will be going to college, given that they're male, that's this, they're going to college, given that they're male, all right, or that the person will be male, given that they're going to college. So which one is more likely to occur, right? The fact that somebody's going to college, given that they're male, or somebody is male, given that they're going to college. Play around with that a little bit. All right. Well, it may seem at the outset that these should be the same thing, but they're not. All right. So in this case, right, as soon as we know that the person is a male, then this is the entire sample space. So the number of people that qualify as being male, the denominator, is 30. And the number that are going to college now are just 16. So we get 16 thirtieths, which is about 0.53. On the other hand, if we know that they're going to college, then this is now our sample space, right? And the denominator is all the people going to college, which is 29. And then the numerator is actually also that 16, right? It's, it's now this, because those are the males in the sample space of going to college. Now that is about 0.55. So this is slightly more likely. And this can be very confusing, right? It's slightly more likely that a person who's going to college is male, right? Then a person who's male is going to college. There's a 53% chance that if you're male, you're going to college. On the other hand, there's a 55% chance that if you're going to college, you're male. Ooh, that's, that can be very confusing. Very, very confusing. And that's conditional probability. All right, we'll pause the video now and think about this before we go to the back side of the sheet. Okay, I'm going to clear this out. Okay, 
So what we want to do is we want to develop some formulas that will help us calculate conditional probabilities. Now you might think to yourself again, I don't need any formulas, that, that work just fine. But let's take a look at this. In the generic Venn diagram shown to the right, each dot represents an equally likely outcome. A equally likely outcome, that should be the word an. Sorry about that. An equally likely outcome of the sample space. Some of these fall into only into event A, some only into event B, and some in both events, and some in neither, right? So it's your classic Venn diagram, your union, your intersection, the stuff that doesn't fall in either one of the events. It says consider the probability of A occurring given that B has occurred. Give a formula for this probability based on counting the number of elements in each set and their intersection. All right. So, well, all right. Remember, this is A given B has happened. But that means that B is now my sample space. It's my S, if you will. All right, it's not actually set S. So this now is my, my sample space. This is the whole thing. So the denominator now should be the number of elements in B. Because I know B has occurred, I, none of these elements matter anymore. Right? I've got information. I'm, I'm, I'm inside a B, right? But what's interesting now is that is what the numerator should be. The numerator should be these guys, right? Now, what is that? Well, right, I mean, you might say, well, those, those are the elements of A that lie in B. But what's cool about that is that's the number of elements in the intersection, the number of elements in A and B. And this gives us a classic formula. All right, the probability of A given B is the number of elements in A and B divided by the number of elements in B. All right, so it's the, it's the intersection of A and B divided by B. And it makes sense, right? Because the intersection of A and B gives you all the elements in A that lie in B. And since B is now your sample space, we're good to go. Now that formula is very helpful and you can use it a lot, but I actually want a formula where the probability of A given B just depends on probabilities and not counts. Now this is tricky, so let's take a look at this. Letter B says divide both the numerator and the denominator in A by the number of total elements in the sample space. Okay, so let's write this out together. So right now we've got this formula. What this thing is telling me to do is actually to create a complex fraction. It says divide both the numerator and the denominator by the number of total elements in the sample space, so by everything. Now, remember, this is completely okay. You do this all the time. If I have 6 ninths and you divide that by 3 and that by 3, right, and you get 2 thirds, well, you know 6 ninths and 2 thirds are the same fraction. So you can always take the numerator or denominator of a fraction and divide it by anything you want as long as you do that also to the numerator. But now we can write this probability formula in terms of just probabilities. Because the numerator, right, the number in A and B divided by the number in the entire sample space, well that's the probability of that intersection, the probability of A and B. And then the number of elements in B divided by the number of elements in S, well, that's just the probability of B. So this is an amazingly important formula as well. The probability of A given B can be calculated by doing the probability that A and B both happen divided by the probability of B. Okay? Now, I know there's a lot of formulas here. Okay, but you have to commit them to memory. These are not formulas that tend to show up on formula sheets that you're given before a standardized exam. So let's get a little workout with it, especially with that formula in letter B. Pause the video now. Write down anything you need to. Okay. Here we go. A survey was taken to examine the relationship between hair color and eye color. The chart below shows the proportion of people surveyed who fell into each category. 
If a person was picked at random, find each of the following conditional probabilities. Show the calculation you used. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to use that formula a ton that we just developed, okay? Because these are all probabilities, all right? They're not counts, and that makes it a little bit harder. Okay, so it says find the probability that a person has brown eyes given they have blonde hair. Well, using that last formula, I'm going to use BR for brown. I can find this by finding the probability of brown and blonde divided by the probability that they have blonde hair. So what's the probability that they have brown eyes and blonde hair? Well, here's brown, here's blonde, maybe I shouldn't have used BL. That's the probability that a person picked at random has both brown eyes and blonde hair. It's 10%. All right. On the other hand, the probability that a person I picked at random just has blonde hair is 0.35 right? So now if I take 0 0.10 divided by 0.35, I'm going to have about 0.29, about 29%. So, and again, it, it's very simple. That, that's just like saying, hey, look, 29% of people who have blonde hair have brown eyes. That's all it's saying. 29% of people with blonde hair have brown eyes. Now letter B says find the probability that a person that the person had red hair given they have green eyes. See if you can do this one for yourself. Find the probability that a person has red hair given that they have green eyes. All right. Well again, I want to write out this formula again and again because it's a very important one. All right. This will be the probability they have red hair and green eyes divided by the probability that they have green eyes. Okay, so again, this is the denominator and then put the two together and you get the numerator. Well, the probability they have red hair and green eyes. Well, here's red hair, here's green eyes, and there's a 15% chance that they have both. Now, the probability that they just have green eyes is 25%. So, when we divide those two, all right, we get exactly 0 0.60, or 60%. Now, think about that for a moment. Again, what that means is if I pick a person and they have green eyes, there's a 60% chance that they have red hair, all right? 60% chance. Now letter C says, does having red hair seem to have some dependence on having green eyes? How can you tell or quantify this dependence? So think about that a little bit. Does having red hair have some kind of dependence on having green eyes? And the answer is absolutely. Absolutely. They're certainly not independent of each other. Now, how do you quantify that? Well, we'll be getting into this way more in future lessons, but it's this simple. A random person chosen has only a 20% chance of having red hair. Right? How do I know that? Well, it's right here. Right? A person chosen at random has only 20% chance of having red hair. But a person with green eyes has a 60% chance of having red hair. See, if there was no dependence, right, if they were completely independent, then the probability of a person with green eyes having red hair would be the same as the probability of a person with brown eyes having red hair or the person with, with you know, um, 
blue eyes having red hair. But there is a much greater probability that you're going to have red hair if you have green eyes than if you don't. So there seems to be some kind of dependence there. All right. Okay, pause the video now and think hard about what we did on this page, and then we'll wrap up the lesson. Okay, I'm going to clear out the text, and let's finish up. So today, we learned about conditional probability, and this is a really, really neat topic. It leads to a lot of other things in probability. It's this idea that you're trying to calculate the probability of an event based on having some additional information. That's the way I like to look at it. So it's not just, hey, what's the probability it's going to rain? It's, what's the probability it's going to rain given that it's 45 degrees outside, you know? So there's this extra bit of, of information thrown in that changes the probability calculation. Now that actual calculation of conditional probability is easy sometimes, and it's more complicated other times, and there were some very important formulas that we introduced today that you should commit to memory. All right, so work on that on the homework. For now, I'd like to thank you for joining me for another Common Core Algebra 2 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler, and until next time, keep thinking and keep solving problems.